Hello everybody! Welcome to Microbiology! I know you've already started this with Bianca and I'm going to kind of pick up where she left off. So let's go! What are bacteria? Well, bacteria are single-celled organisms. They are prokaryotic, meaning that they don't have a nuclear membrane. So if you remember, our cells are eukaryotic, so the nucleus is encased in a membrane. That's the difference between eukaryotic and prokaryotic. So bacteria do not have a nuclear membrane. Most of the organelles that are found in our cells, mammalian cells and animal cells, are absent, except for cell walls, plasma membranes, and ribosomes. So they don't have all the mitochondria and, and Golgi bodies and all that sort of stuff that we do. Some may contain capsules and flagella and can develop endospores. I'll talk a bit more about endospores on another slide. Um, they are small. Bacteria are very, very, very small. And that's something that you probably learned in the lab or you will. Um, and because you'll have to go down to the, you know, usually at the 100 times objective will get you there. Um, so you know that they're small. They have specific requirements for temperature, for pH, oxygen, tension, nutrition. Um, each species kind of is specific about those sorts of things. And I would say the same goes for, for different species of animals, um, but especially so with bacteria. So we have to consider that when we're collecting and preparing samples. And we can use these characteristics also to help us identify samples. Here's a nice little generalized generic picture of a bacterium. Um, so we have our um, capsule in some cases. Uh, so we've got capsule on the outside, the cell wall is in inside the capsule, and then we have plasma membrane. Not all bacteria will have all of these structures, by the way. This is just generalized. A lot of, you know, back, different bacteria will have different components of this. They will all have a cell wall. Um, they would all have a capsule. Uh, so uh, just important to remember. Then, of course, the inside of the cell is full of cytoplasm, just like in any cell. We've got ribosomes, these little bodies in here. We've got plasmids. Pili, so those are like little hairs on the surface of the bacteria, and um, a nucleoid, so it's um, got circular DNA, and it's not encased again in the capsule. So important to remember. And then you've got your flagellum. Certain bacteria will have a flagellum, which kind of helps it to move around. Interesting little creatures. Characteristics of bacteria. So they're are two main shapes of bacteria. So there are rods, which are called bacilli. A single rod would be a bacillus. And then cocci, which is those little round guys, and spirals. So you might be familiar with a couple of spiral bacteria like leptospirosis. It's, for instance, a spiral-shaped bacteria. Bacteria can come in chains and clusters, pairs, tetrads, palisades. Um, I have a diagram, I think, on the next slide, which is going to show you that. And bacteria tend to reproduce by binary fission. So this is binary fission over here. Cell replicates its DNA, so the nucleoid gets replicated. Um, and then the membrane elongates. We get the wall kind of kind of like pinches off. The wall forms completely, and then we have daughter cells. That's what that means. A term that you might hear sometimes is generation time, and that's the time for the population to double. So if we have six bacteria, it's the time it's going to take us to get to 12, and that sort of thing. And this varies by species as well. Here are some different bacterial shapes that you're going to see. Uh, the most common being our bacilli, which are these rod-shaped bacteria, and cocci, these little round ones. And then we get, again, spirals, our spirochetes. And then, especially when we're talking about um, these little cocci bacteria, like strep and staph and stuff, um, they come in specific uh, groupings sometimes. So there's chains, there's clusters, they look kind of like clusters of grapes. There's pears or tetrads, and then palisades can be different kind of arrangements that can look anything like any of these. So, you know, if you see 
specific you know chains or clusters or whatever that can actually help you to identify the species of bacteria you're looking at oxygen requirements is something that we can use um, for a couple of things one of them is you know to identify organisms That's a, this is a really useful tool for that it also um, depending where the bacteria is found and sort of what bacteria we might be looking for. You know, this also really affects how we're gonna collect our samples and store them and ship them and that kind of thing. So we have obligate aerobes. Obligate aerobes are bacteria that require oxygen to survive. So they're kind of like us. We require oxygen to survive. Well, so do our obligate aerobes. So um, we're not gonna find obligate aerobes inside our bodies where there is no air. So maybe in our lungs and that sort of thing, but we're not going to find them in our gastrointestinal tract most of the way through um, or floating around in our abdomen or anything like that. Obligate anaerobes are either growth inhibited or killed if there is oxygen present. So they're the ones that we're not going to be finding on our skin or anything like that because they wouldn't survive. They're the ones we find usually in our guts and that sort of thing. We have facultative anaerobes. They can survive in oxygen, but their growth is limited. Uh, Microaerophilic organisms prefer lower oxygen tension or saturation, so decreased oxygen environments. And then we have capnophilic organisms that actually need high levels of carbon dioxide to survive. pH, so most bacteria kind of live in the same range as our own body fluids. Uh, which makes sense for pathogenic bacteria at least they kind of want to stay in the same range that we're at take advantage of that so most of them are are in 6.5 to 7.5 range um, they have nutritional requirements as does any organism so uh, these are fastidious microbes means they have really strict nutritional requirements and that's why we're able to grow them so nicely on things like agar medium temperature so there's three kind of categories of bacteria when it comes to temperature requirements there are mesophiles and again this is nearly all pathogenic bacteria in animals and that's they grow best between 20 and 40 degrees celsius so again in that range as most animals will you know normal body temperatures will be in the 20 to 40 degrees celsius range um, so reptiles tending to be lower and mammals tending to be higher uh, there's psychrophiles and they thrive at lower temperatures and thermophiles, which live at higher temperatures. So I talked a bit a few slides ago about endospores. Um, so some genera of bacteria have endospores. What are endospores? Well, they are um, structures, these little round ones in this diagram, that are resistant to heat, desiccation, chemicals, and radiation. And they can be found at different places in the cell. And these actually just help bacteria survive conditions that would otherwise probably kill them. Bacterial growth. So as we talked about, bacteria contain a single DNA strand. They re reproduce primarily by binary fission. So the nuclear uh, material replicates and the, the cell wall, um, cell membrane kind of pinches off and creates two cells. There are four phases of bacterial growth. There's the initial phase. I think I have a diagram actually coming up, but there's an initial phase um, of growth, which is a lag phase. So they're adapting to the new media at this point. So nothing much is happening. Then they get their exponential growth where they their numbers are doubling um, or growing very rapidly. And that continues until the nutrients are used up or waste products accumulate or until the space is limited um, in whatever medium they're trying to grow in. Then we have the stationary phase. There's nothing really much happening. The numbers aren't going up or down. And then finally we get the death phase. So this is when spores form to help bacteria to actually survive um, less than ideal conditions. Here's the graph. So we have numbers of bacteria here and time here so here we have our lag phase and then oh hey we've got good stuff to eat here we have our exponential growth and then we get to our stationary phase nothing's going on la 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 and then oh crap here we start to die off and again this is the log decline is what it's called but basically they drop off the numbers and those who are able to will form endospores to help them survive 
couple of notes on common bacterial species. Gram-positive cocci and gram-positive rods are two of the most common things you will see. Also gram-negative rods. Uh, we will see quite a bit under the microscope, as you've probably found out. Um, there is this website, this UPenn website, that will give you more information on these guys. Gram staining, that kind of thing. Acid fast bacteria. So these are these are characteristics of bacteria that you're going to see um, usually based on results that you're going to get from an external lab. So you get there are acid fast bacteria, the gram negative bacteria, um, anaerobes that you'll see in the GI tract, the spirochetes and curved bacteria. So those ones that are spirally or curved shaped, you see those in the urine mucosa. Um, mycoplasma. Mycoplasma is an interesting category of um, often highly resistant bacteria, pathogenic bacteria. Um, these are not great bacteria to have, um, so that's something that you might run across uh, from time to time in practice. And we have our obligate intracellular organisms. So these are bacteria obviously that live within cells and they have to live within cells. That's what obligate means. Antimicrobial sensitivity testing. This is something that's done quite often in practice, and I would say it should probably be done more often than it is. The reason behind that is that if we actually do uh, antimicrobial sensitivity testing, we can pick the right antibiotic for the job without just exposing animals to broad spectrum antibiotics all the time, which, you know, of course keeps all those antibiotics um, in the food chain and that kind of thing and and uh, creates antibiotic resistance and there's a whole bunch of ethical issues that go along with that. So all that to, to say we should probably do a lot more antimicrobial sensitivity testing than we do. So how do we do it? We isolate bacterial samples from the patient and then uh, we send those away usually and um, they're cultured and it's determined which antibiotics are going to work best, essentially, um, for, for, for which bacteria. There's a couple of different ways of doing it. There's the agar diffusion method. Uh, it's a pretty common one. You look for and measure areas around an antibiotic disc that have no growth. So we'll have an agar plate with all these antibiotics on discs um, on top of the plate, and then there will be a certain, a certain radius, I guess, around each um, antibiotic that where, where those bacteria will not have been able to grow. So that's how we determine how well those work. So this is an example of that. Here we have our disc on our agar plate with a certain antibiotic and then we have the circle around it and then here this is the, in, the inhibitory kind of range here. So this is not allowing bacterial growth from here all the way over to there. So that's agar diffusion. And I believe that we usually call that the zone of inhibition. Um, quality control testing is basically all this is saying is that you need to periodically test for known organisms uh, or test known samples. And what that means is you want to make sure that your techniques are good if you're looking to um, culture bacteria and identify them and things like that. So you want to do this always with any lab stuff. Uh, you want to compare your results with standardized results and ensure that your equipment, any equipment in the lab really this goes for, is functioning accurately, it's tested regularly. So for instance, you want to record an incubator's temperature once a day at least. Record results and always maintain logs of results. Um, so there's some concerns with quality control. The biggest one, if you're dealing with bacteria, is you need a septic technique. So you have to, to be very, very careful when handling bacterial samples because it's very easy to contaminate them. So always be conscious of your aseptic technique if you're sending anything for culture. Um, it's important to time the sample collection and the processing of that sample properly. You don't want it to sit too long uh, before it gets sent away or tested or that sort of thing. Always use proper staining techniques for whatever you're looking for. And um, again, all equipment having to do with, with culture has to be maintained properly. Shifting gears, we're going to talk about mycology. What is mycology? It is the study of fungi. So. Let's talk fungal characteristics for a moment. Fungus 
or fungi are heterotrophs. So they can either be parasitic, and we all know what that means, or they can be saprophytic, meaning they're decomposers. So these are the things that like to feast on dead things, essentially. Um, most fungi are multicellular, except for yeast. They have eukaryotic cells within cell walls of chitin. So they're not like bacteria, which were prokaryotes, meaning they don't have a nuclear membrane, remember? So these guys are eukaryotic cells, and they have cell walls made of chitin. This is a, a, a normal thing for, for fungi. They have large webs of slender tubes, and those webs are called mycelia. So the singular of that is mycelium. And the slender tubes um, that make up those webs are hyphae. And as you would imagine, if you're looking at a big multicellular web webby um, fungus, it's always going to grow towards a food source because it's looking for food, just like every other organism in the whole world. So that makes sense. They digest food internally um, with enzymes. And uh, yeast are a little different from all of these, but, but uh, similar in some ways as well. They re but they reproduce by budding. So here's the mycelium that I was just talking about here. So the web mycelium made up of hyphae. So all these little tubes here would be hyphae, singular being hypha. Um, so here's our little hypha, our close up. These are each individual cells. Each one has a nucleus here, vacuoles, that sort of thing. And this would be a specific type of hypha called a septate hypha. So we have um, here a septum which is basically like a little wall that separates all the cells. So these are septae. Um, so there's a septum and each septum has a pore in it because things still need nutrients and, and, and fluids and stuff still need to be able to move back and forth between these cells and they do that through these pores. So that's a septate hypha. Very similar really to a senocytic hypha, except senocytic hyphae do not have those septa or septae. So looks pretty much the same, works pretty much the same, we just don't have those the, the septum in between the cells. Let's talk about pathogenic fungal organisms because this is obviously the uh, the only ones that we really worry about in animals. These are classified based on their reproductive structures. It's just the way it works. So um, we have basidiomycetes. These are things like mushrooms or a club fungi. They kind of um, have, they usually have these basidia spores. Uh, don't worry about this. Just know that this is how we classify them. Ascomite seeds. Ascomite seeds are, they have, they're, they're also called cup fungi, and they reproduce with these ascospores. Uh, Zygomite seeds, that's like this here. It's, this is a very strange way um, of reproduction, but anyway, that's zygomycetes, deutermycetes, uh, also known as fungi imperfecti. They don't have a known sexual stage. This is not important for you to know. All I really want you to take away from this is that we we actually um, classify our, um, our our fungi based on their structure. Fungal cultures. So so. I don't know if uh, how many of you maybe have already done one of these and how many of you maybe have not, uh, but uh, one thing I want to bring to your attention, so this being a fungus A down here, um, there are some safety issues uh, with fungal cultures. So biological safety cabinets are usually recommended if you're going to be doing these in clinic. So a lot of times these are shipped to diagnostic labs um, for culture and identification. So if you think that there's a, a, an infectious fungus, just don't don't really deal with it, just send it away. Um, and sometimes you have to send with them a, a statement of risk on a submission form, so just be aware of that. So the only one that we really do commonly is, is dermatophyte culture in practice, because a lot of fungi, fungi are, are potentially quite dangerous. Here's our dermatophytes, aren't they cute? So uh, dermatophytes, you guys might know them better as ringworm, usually. Um, so woods lamps, are, we use a lot of time to uh, to try to screen for these. So an animal that has a skin condition that you think could potentially be ringworm or some dermatophyte, uh, you can use a, a woods lamp, which is like a blue light, 
um, get the animal in a dark room and shine the blue light on the affected area and see if it glows. And if it does, that's very consistent with dermatophytosis. Dermatophytes are readily cultured and identified. Uh, you can pluck hair or you can collect hair by brushing the lesion with a new toothbrush. Collect, uh, you can collect samples from nails with clippers. Um, so you push the hair or nails into the agar on the fungus A or the dermatophyte test medium. Um, and it's got agar in it too. You basically bag the plate or the or the fungus A and you incubate it up to three weeks and then you're looking for a ch color change in the first three to five days. Um, and, uh, and you eventually will get a growth of the fungus and you can actually look at it microscopically to identify it. Here's ringworm. Ringworm is zoonotic. I think a lot of you probably know that. I know that firsthand, unfortunately. Um, dogs and cats, horses, cattle, those species, the ones that we work with most commonly, it's really certainly not uncommon in any of these species. So our clients are at risk as well as their animals. The scales on these guys, loss of fur, this dandruff, red inflamed skin. Um, you see, they ha it tends to happen on the head and the ears and the legs. It can be localized or it can be over the entire body. Um, there are silent carriers. This is where we get into trouble sometimes. Some people come in and they're like, look, my doctor diagnosed me with ringworm. I have no idea where I got it. I I'm just they're looking for lesions on their cat or whatever and you don't find anything. These guys might have it, but it might be, you know, they might be silent carriers. So, we, so they're just not showing clinical signs. Um, how do we treat it? Well, shampoo, um, topical dips, things like lime dip, sulfur lime, um, oral medications. These are all used. Um, they all kind of suck for one reason or another. Uh, so some of them are really, really expensive, like those oral medications. Some of them are really, really stinky, like the sulfur lime. Um, so it's not the best thing to have, but um, it is ultimately treatable. Uh, it's really important to get a diagnostic skin scraping when you're looking for this kind of thing. It's really easy to miss, honestly, in clinic. This is something that really needs to be cultured to be found. Um, but uh, really still uh, important to know how to do a diagnostic skin scraping. I think most of you do, so I'm going to skip the video, but you can have a look on YouTube for these videos if you want. And ye yeast. So let's talk about yeast. This is very important in our field. A lot of animals have yeast infections and chronic yeast issues uh, in their skin and ears primarily. Um, so we identify yeast in cytologic, in cytologic examination of stained exudate. So what that means is that, you know, often ear swabs or, uh, or swabs of the skin, you know, interdigital skin or something like that will, will often show us yeast. Um, if there's enough of it, then we consider it to be an infection. It's not uncommon to have a few yeasts here and there, but if we're having an animal with a sample that looks like this, we can be pretty confident that that's a yeast infection. So what are the common pathogenic yeasts? Number one, uh, malassezia. Uh, it's malassezia pachydermatis. Um, that's going to be the one that you find most of all, most commonly, um, and it kind of looks like footprint or snowman or whatever you want to, you know, however you want to describe it. Another one that's quite common is candida, candida albicans. The rest of these, they absolutely happen. I'm not going to go into detail on any of them. What is this yeast? Well, this is our footprint yeast. This is malassezia and they look like this. They don't always, sometimes they just look nice and round like this one or oval, I guess. Um, but they're always, always budding. That's why they have this kind of footprint appearance to them. So that's malassezia. And this is candida. Candida being, of course, the other one that we will see quite commonly. And I would say more often than not, we see yeast in ears, but other skin issues absolutely as well. So up here, we have a picture of a really horribly inflamed, infected Cocker Spaniel ear. You'll get used to seeing these if you aren't already. Um, otitis externa, most commonly caused by either bacteria or yeast. Sometimes it's just inflammatory or whatever, but very commonly bacteria or yeast. 
these ear external ear canals get red inflamed painful itchy these drive these animals crazy more chronic infections tend to be more dry and crusty that's not to say because it's dry and crusty that it's not an active infection it is it's just a long-term ongoing issue exudate is usually dark colored so if we're just looking at a regular exudate um they tend to be like dark wax if we're starting to get into an infected ear the exudate often is still dark and wetter um, and ultimately can be pus a stain smear can show you if there's yeast versus bacteria versus white blood cells or any combination thereof uh, treatment how do we treat it well we usually do a really good cleaning of the ears while an animal is in clinic and then we choose medication based on what we've found on cytology. I don't just choose medication actually based on what I find on cytology. I also choose cleansers. So what, what am I going to use to clean out this ear? There are certain cleansers that are better for certain species of pathogen. Um, culture and sensitivity we do in these really awful recurrent ear infections. It's always a bit of a pain to do these because you have to take the animal off any kind of antibiotic treatment for about a week or two before. So to let a raging ear infection go like that, I find really hard to do and so do owners, but it's really great if you're able to say it's the first time you're seeing an animal with a horrible ear infection, just take a sample and send it away right away for aerobic culture because um, you really need to know what to use on a really nasty ear if it looks something like that.